they took Crystal's life, so they don't need to be here on earth anymore either. I hope they get to death penalty. If he done the crime, he should pay the time. I feel good. I feel real good about today. Wheels don't fail me now. Let's get out of here somehow. I'm Shay McAllister, and this is Bardstown. One week after Brooks Houck was arrested for the murder of his girlfriend, Crystal Rogers, the Nelson County Courthouse was buzzing. The newly accused killer was expected to be arraigned on the charges, and his team of attorneys planned to request his bond be lowered from $10 million down to $500,000. About an hour before the doors opened to the courtroom, we found Crystal's grandparents waiting in the lobby area. Brooks Hawk attorney is saying that he should be out, he should be able to go to work, and he should be able to take care of his son. What a joke. What a joke, yeah. Of course, it's not his family. That's his job. I know he's got to do that. That's his job, but it's a, nothing but a joke. I don't think that's going to happen. No, that's not going to happen. Till and Betty Ballard never miss developments in their granddaughter's case. When a suspect appears in court... They're some of the first to arrive at the courthouse. When police search properties, they drive to the location and talk to investigators. And long before there were any arrests, they were asking questions, in some cases directly to the people they suspected were involved. Right after Sherry was missing, Crystal was missing, Betty and I went, talked to Brooks and Rosemary. And I asked him, I said, uh, if you tell me where she's at, I'll go get her and I won't mention your name. I said, uh, you tell me where she's at, I'll go get her. And uh, he never would answer, he'd just stay in a daze, you know. And I knew right then he was guilty as hell. Till told us he was looking forward to seeing Brooks Houck walked in in handcuffs. But shortly after we got to the courthouse, a bailiff informed us that wouldn't happen. Instead, Brooks would be appearing over video from the jail. I really wanted to see him parade him through here. I really wanted that. Till was disappointed but still grateful. This was the most progress his granddaughter's case had seen in the eight years since she disappeared. He deserves where he's at, and he needs to be there for the rest of his life. That's what I'm hoping for Brooktown. I don't think he'll ever have to see daylight again. I don't think he will. Too heinous a crime than what they did to Crystal. And... As far as we know, we don't know what they've done to her. We know they murdered her, but we, we don't know. And Tommy also. And Tommy, my son. Yeah, we think that they're involved in Tommy's death. Yeah, 100%. And then the doors to the courtroom opened up. We're going to bring the family in first. The bailiff invited family to enter the courtroom first until his wife Betty and daughter Teresa all walked inside. Crystal's mom, Sherry Ballard, and Crystal's children weren't far behind them. And that's when we noticed just how many people came to hear the case that aren't part of the family. A teacher from Lexington named Delena Jones made the hour-long drive to Bardstown just to show her support. We're on fall break this week, and I just wanted to be a part of it as much as possible, just to kind of be here for Sherry Ballard, the family, you with what an advocate you've been, and I would give anything for every family to have somebody like you just pushing it out there and trying to get answers. So you made the drive just to support the family? Absolutely, and I would do it again. Once I heard he was asking for a lower bond and kind of work release, you know, I'm just kind of like, you've kind of been on work release for quite a while. So just kind of hoping for the family's sake that he kind of stays where he is just so that we don't have to worry about them seeing him again out in the public right now. The support stretched far for the Ballard family, even extending to people who have never met them. And it showed in a sea of pink the color Sherry picked early on to represent her missing daughter. As the courtroom filled and turned to standing room only, pink shirts, sweaters, and dresses stood out on both sides of the gallery. And then the bailiff called for quiet in the courtroom. As the judge walked in, wearing a black robe, 
and Brooks Hauk appeared on a TV screen facing the courtroom. All right, we're here today in regard to an arraignment. At a typical arraignment, the defendant will hear the charges they're facing, enter a plea, either guilty or not guilty, and then the attorneys and judge will agree on the next court date. But, like so many aspects of this case, this court hearing was far from typical. That became clear in the first two minutes, when the judge asked the prosecutor how much evidence they planned to present. There's numerous, numerous um, pages of discovery that were gener- generated by the FBI as well as the Kentucky State Police, and we're in the process of redacting that right now and get that to the defense counsel. When you say there's numerous pages, approximately how many pages are you talking about? Thousands. Thousands. Thousands of pages of evidence, which he would later describe as a terabyte. That includes police interviews, search warrants, grand jury proceedings, photographs, videos, and audio recordings. The prosecutor tells the judge it will take him one week to present the case to a jury, and the judge asks both parties if they're ready to set a trial date. Brooks Houck's attorney, Brian Butler, quickly interjects. And again, we're still not done with it, uh, so I don't think there's any way Mr. Houck can get a fair trial in 2024. But I think this is markedly different than the general case that we did just because of that amount of discovery and nothing else. He explains his team is going to need the better part of a year to review the evidence, consult experts, and build a case to defend Brooks Houck. Meaning, we're looking at a trial in 2025. But that conversation is saved for a later court date, and the judge turns the focus to the motion filed by Houck's team of attorneys, asking for his $10 million bond to be lowered to $500,000. Attorney Brian Butler walks up to the podium to present his case. I said it in my motion, I'll say it again. The grand jury out of Nelson County that set this bond, I have been practicing 28 years. I have never heard of a bond even coming close to this. Brooks' attorney, Brian Butler, is an experienced litigator from the Louisville area. He's represented big names in big murder cases before, but he admits this one stands out. This is, of course, an unusual case because look, I mean, look at all these people here that care about it. One side or the other, people supporting Mr. Howe, people that are not. The attorney began building his case for a bond reduction, pointing to Brooks' life outside of jail. He has as strong a ties to this community as any defendant can have. He has family that love him. He has friends that love him. His son is here. His business is here. He cannot and he will not leave, and he's proven that. That quick mention of his family caught the prosecutor's attention. Here's Prosecutor Shane Young. The defendant speaks in his motion about his loving support of his family. I completely agree. They've been supportive. The prosecutor had a point to make here of just how supportive the family has been. He accused them of engaging in criminal conduct when they secretly recorded grand jury proceedings, a clear violation of Kentucky law. Grand jury proceedings are secret. In this matter, the defendant's sister, Rhonda McElvoy Houck, Brother, Nicholas Houck. Mother, Rosemary Houck. Brother-in-law, Alex McAvoy. And Rosemary Houck's live-in boyfriend, Larry Mott, all recorded, secretly brought in recorders and recorded the grand jury. I've been practicing here, Your Honor, for 25 years in this state, and I have yet, ever, heard of anyone recording a grand jury. While naming the members of the Houck family, the prosecutor turned around in the courtroom and pointed at them in the gallery behind him. His pauses between each name, giving the judge an extra moment to let the significance of that accusation completely sink in. It'll need to be sealed because it does contain the grand jury proceeding. The the total time of the tape is nearly five hours. The first two hours of it is interaction between Mr. Brooks Houck and his sister, where they talk about Brooks Houck shows her how to run the recorder, tells her he wants a tape of it. The question is why? 
I think everyone in this courtroom knows why. To make sure everyone's story is consistent. Quote, to make sure everyone's story is consistent. A strong allegation suggesting the entire family had something to hide. That was the prosecutor's example of why Brooks having access to his family while he waits for trial wouldn't be a good idea. But Brooks' attorney had a different explanation for those secret recordings. There's two ways to look at that, and that's what trials are for. One way to look at that is exactly what Mr. Young said, that you want to, look at, you want to know what's being said because you did something wrong. The other way you look at that is law enforcement, local law enforcement, comes out and says you're the prime suspect and releases evidence and gets you excoriated on podcasts and medias and signs and yards. Who in their right mind wouldn't want to know what was being said? That is not a condition of bond. And attorney Brian Butler stayed focused on that $10 million bond, the highest he said he's ever heard of in his career, a bond he called oppressive and well beyond Brooks' means. If Brooks Howe could pay $10 million, he'd be sitting right there between Mike and I. He cannot. While this case is pending, if he remains incarcerated with a $10 million bond, his business will fail. His son will be without a father. It will be very difficult for him to assist his attorneys in the preparation of his defense in a case, as Mr. Young candidly told the court, has probably more discovery than any criminal case that your honor has ever had in his courtroom in in a long career, uh, and probably the most I've ever seen in a long career. The attorney asked the judge to consider releasing Brooks on a $500,000 bond with GPS monitoring allowing him to be home with his child, continue to work, and meet with his attorneys to build his case. And the purpose of those bond conditions is not to set a bond that's so high that it guarantees the person can't make it, which is what the grand jury did. The purpose of that bond is to set a bond that reasonably gives the court comfort that the defendant will follow the court's conditions. There was never a bond on Brooks Houck the last eight years related to this disappearance. Yet, here he was. Brooks' attorney says his client could have left Nelson County at any time over the last eight years, but he chose to stay. He says a $10 million bond isn't necessary. But the prosecutor disagreed. He says it's very necessary, and it was a number they chose strategically. And I can tell you I've never asked for a $10 million bond. This is the first multimillionaire I've prosecuted for murder. The defendant has vast resources, Your Honor. We Prosecutor Shane that. Young describes yeah. Brooks Houck as a multimillionaire, a fortune gained through ownership of three companies and dozens and dozens of rental properties. The combined tax assessment for those properties owned by these three companies is $8,448,815. Now, that does not include 12 pieces of property that I was unable to locate tax assessments for. It also does not include 168 pieces of property that the defendant owns at Pasco Ballard Road where his mother as well as his sister resides. The defendant maintains at least 74 rental properties that he is deriving income from on a monthly basis. This also, this number, the $8 million number, does not include the money He is earning from his businesses building new homes and does not include any type of wealth that he's amassed in his bank account, including a 2018 sale of 20-something properties for $1.8 million. Simply stated, the defendant, a $10 million for the defendant is a fair bond. Somebody with this vast amount of resources, $500,000 to an individual who is a multimillionaire when you are looking at the rest of your life in prison is not a lot to pay to influence a case. And then the judge interjected with a very pointed question, a question that would lead to the biggest bombshell of the day. 
Here's Nelson County Judge Charles Sims. Certainly one of the things the court is, is concerned about in this case is, is obviously a bond that's reasonable to assure his appearance, but also the safety of any witnesses. Is the Commonwealth wanting to go anywhere with any other investigations that are going on in regard to this matter? Yes, sir, we are. And that's when this court hearing really took a turn. The moment we learned a possible connection everyone has suspected was not just a rumor and not just conspiracy. The link between the Hauk brothers and Tommy Ballard's death was under investigation and a real possibility. I will tell your honor, we're investigating the murder of Tommy Ballard that could potentially be related to this case. The, we are waiting for testing to come back on the farm we believe was used to murder Tommy Ballard, a farm that we purchased from Nicholas Houck, who was using a fake name when he sold the right. We know it's the same caliber. There's five criteria that the, they're looking at, and so far it's matched four of the five criteria. A quick scan of the room revealed just how shocking that comment was. At the mention of the murder of her husband, Sherry Ballard looked to the ceiling, her eyes swelling with tears. Just a few seats down from her, Tommy's parents, Till and Betty. Till grabbed Betty's knee and didn't let go. This family has believed the disappearance of Crystal and the death of her dad, Tommy, were connected since the moment he was killed. But no investigator has ever linked the two officially much less confirmed the Hauk family were suspects in his death, too. The prosecutor had just revealed he had the gun he believed was used to kill Tommy Ballard, and the gun was purchased from Nick Hauk. We had a lot of new questions, and we would be asking them in just a few minutes. But before court dismissed, the prosecutor left the judge with these final words. It's been stated before, the truth will set you free. The problem in this matter is the truth will imprison Brooks Howe. And then court was over. The judge said he needed a few days to review all of the information and he would make a decision later. The screen where Brooks Howe had appeared went black and the courtroom doors opened. Rosemary Howe, Brooks' mom, chatted with his attorney briefly before turning to leave the courtroom. After all of the accusations we heard today, from secret recordings of grand jury proceedings to Nick Houck, considered a suspect in the death of Tommy Ballard, we had questions for Rosemary. Rosemary, the special prosecutor accused you of violating Kentucky law today. What do you have to say about that? Are your sons involved in the deaths of... Did your son Nick Ballard. kill Tommy Ballard? Rogers, you'd like to Did your son kill Tommy Ballard, Miss Houck? She never stopped walking to answer any of my questions, and I didn't follow her out of the courthouse. Once it became clear she wasn't going to stop, I turned my attention to the Ballard family, who I knew would be walking out at any moment. Till Ballard, Tommy's dad, and his daughter Teresa, Tommy's sister, were smiling as they saw us walking out of the doors of the courtroom. I feel good. I feel real good about today. Why? I don't know. It just, uh, the prosecutor, uh, what he discussed, I think we're moving forward. Uh, I think we're going to get there one day soon. Teresa stands by her parents' side, one arm comfortably resting over her father's shoulder. She looks confident and comfortable. The news of her brother's case is sitting well with her. Today feels like a win for us. It's just the beginning. Yeah. It's a long road. It's a very long road, but we feel good. Her mom, Betty, is standing behind her, but listening closely. When we ask about Tommy and the Houck family's possible involvement, she scoots forward to weigh in. They knew he wasn't going to give up, and he would. No, Tommy wasn't going to stop. I think he was getting close, yeah. <clears throat> uh, that's the reason they had to get rid of him, yeah. <clears throat> so how do you feel leaving today? How do you feel I about feel what good. will happen next? I feel good. Sherry Ballard walked out of the courtroom with a wave and a smile. She's been instructed not to make any comments on Crystal's case, and she's respecting that. 
Sherry always says she's not going to do anything to interfere with her family getting justice. But her community was outspoken in the hours after court, watching the wheels of justice move forward in favor of her family. Hopefully they can get the answers that they so desperately have been trying to find over these past eight years. And we're going to believe in the justice system to give that to the Ballards. I was just really hoping for some answers for the family and um, that way they could get some closure. That's all we want for the Ballards is for them to get to the end of this journey because boy, it's it, what a journey they've been through. That court date was on a Thursday and just four days later on Monday, Judge Charles Sims released his decision on Brooks' bond request. The bond won't budge. A judge in Bardstown today decides that 10 million it is for Brooks Houck in jail, and that's where it's going to stay for the accused killer of Crystal Rogers. The judge made his decision known in a five-page ruling filed online. He gave four reasons for keeping the bond at $10 million. First, he believes Brooks has access to substantial financial resources. Second, he believes Brooks could be a flight risk given the severity of his charges. Third, the judge said there is reason to believe witness safety could be at risk if Brooks is released from jail. And finally, the judge believes the integrity of the proceeding is at stake because of the actions of the Hauk family, secretly recording grand jury proceedings and possibly involved in the murder of Tommy Ballard. We took the ruling to Professor Sam Markison, a criminal law expert. He's familiar with the case and says he wasn't surprised that the judge left the bond at $10 million. Recording grand jury testimony against the law, potentially being involved in a murder, an additional murder of Brooks Hauk's brother, Nicholas. Those are reasons that the court can hold you without bail at all, without release at all. So in this case, the judge didn't do that, but he was certainly not going to reduce the bond given those risks. And back in Bardstown, word spread fast. Many people thought the judge made the right move, worried about what would happen if Brooks Houck was released from jail. Especially with somebody with that much money, you never know what they can do, you know? And as far as the witnesses goes, nobody wants to see, you know, something else happen. It's gone on many years. They worked very hard to prosecute him, to get the correct evidence, and I believe now that they finally do have everything they need, yeah, I think he should be held. I think everybody just wants to know why. You know, what's, what's the motive? Why Crystal? Why Tommy? Those are questions we still can't answer. So much of this case is sealed, meaning the records are hidden from public eye. What we can see is the ongoing battle in the courts. As soon as the bond reduction was denied, Brooks' attorneys took aim at the judge behind the decision. The team of attorneys were filing documents fast. First, they filed an appeal with the Kentucky Court of Appeals, and then they asked the Supreme Court of Kentucky to remove Judge Charles Sims from the case, accusing him of showing bias against Brooks Houck. The two highest courts in Kentucky considered the request for months, before responding with rulings against the accused killer. The Supreme Court decided the Nelson County judge would be staying on the case, writing Houck's team did not prove he should be disqualified. And then the Kentucky Court of Appeals released its ruling, denying the request to overturn the bond. It was the end of the road for both motions, meaning this would be the judge that would see the case through to trial. And unless he could put together $10 million, Brooks Houck would be staying in jail until then. I think for the family, we are just praying and believing that justice will be done. They deserve that. They deserve that. They need to find out the truth. The desire for truth and accountability has fueled Sherry Ballard's steadfast search for answers. She has been relentless in her fight to keep her husband and daughter's names top of mind, something she knew could take time. But even Sherry will admit she didn't know it would take this long. When all of this first happened, I remember them telling me it'd be 10 years, you know, before I got found out anything. And I, I just thought that was just... I could not accept that. I'm like, that is crazy. But so to think it's been almost seven years since, you know, that happened to Tommy, it's, I feel like I haven't had him for a lifetime, but to think it's really been seven years, it's unbelievable. 
Just weeks after Brooks Houck's first court date, Sherry decides to break her silence, agreeing to an interview with me. She couldn't talk about Crystal. She wouldn't risk hurting the case. But as her husband's murder hit seven years unsolved, she said she couldn't just stay quiet. I just look at my family and, and I can't imagine no one not fighting for their family. I, I can't imagine that. That was never not an option for me. And, you know, you just do that as a wife. That's, you're, I lost a part of me. Like my other half, I mean that, he was my other half and I lost that. How can I not fight for that? There's, there's no other choice. Sherry Ballard's first interview since the arrest in her daughter's case and her hope for her husband's, next time on Bardstown. The Bardstown Podcast is a WHAS 11 News production. It's written by me, Shay McAllister, and edited by WHAS 11 Chief Photojournalist Philip Merle. You can visit our website, whas11.com, to learn more about the cases and see exclusive visual elements that help explain everything we've talked about today. Let's get out.